Hello, genius. Welcome back to the Own Your Genius podcast, where we discuss building businesses, growing brands, and owning your genius. I'm your host, brand attorney, LaConya Murray. Today's show is in reference to a question I received from a friend and Launch Legally Incubator member. Due to the significance of the question, I thought I'd share it with you all as well. Today's question goes like this. I have a meeting scheduled with a potential consultant to discuss help me flush out my ideas and turn them into products and services. If we work together, it could result in the creation of multiple forms of intellectual property. How can I protect my ideas and my interests while working with this third party? Excellent question. I love this question and I love that she's going into the situation wanting to protect her intellectual property. In my experience, people fit into one or two categories as it relates to this. Either they have no idea what intellectual property is, which means they also don't know how valuable it is and that they should be making steps to protect it. Or two, they have an understanding that intellectual property is valuable, like they know that it's valuable, but they don't know how to identify their own intellectual property. So they don't know exactly what they should protect or how to go about protecting it. So people typically fall into one of those two, those two categories. Intellectual property is property of the mind. I spoke with someone yesterday uh, doing a consultation and they just said, you know, I should be, I feel like I should be getting paid with this stuff that's from my brain. Like all this stuff is coming from my brain and I want to protect it because I created it. And I'm like, yes, that's what ex- exactly what intellectual property is. It's property of the, of the mind, which means that It's something that you thought of and you brought to life in some type of way. You didn't let it just sit inside of your head. You brought it to life and now you want to protect it. There are four main types of intellectual property. You have trademarks, copyrights, patents, and trade secrets. And you can register for the Own Your Genius Challenge on my website to learn more about each of these different types of intellectual property, including what they are, what they protect, and how to identify your own intellectual property. Now, working with a consultant or a coach is only one way or one example, I should say, of where you need to share your ideas with a third party. If you need to hire a developer or an assistant or an employee, you want to keep listening because those are other situations where you're basically sharing your ideas with someone that's not you. When working with third parties, the first thing you need to know is or understand is that intellectual property is not referring to your ideas. Again, I'll say it. Intellectual property is not referring to your ideas. So it's not just the things that are in your brain, right? It's rather the execution of said ideas. So it's what comes from your brain. You didn't just let it sit there. You actually did something about it. So the execution of your ideas is what intellectual property refers to. The purpose of of this and the distinction, the reason that we protect the execution of the ideas rather than the ideas themselves is to reward innovators and really foster creativity. If the threshold was the idea itself, we wouldn't have all the amazing arts, books, inventions, and brands that we have today. Like think about it, real for real, think about it. Think about all the ideas you've had in the last 30 days or maybe the last six months or even the last six years. Now, compare those ideas that you've actually had to those that you've actually acted on. I'm sure that there is a huge difference. And that's not just you. That's me as well. I have ideas that come in my head all the time, but I don't act on all of them. So that's why we want to protect the execution of the idea, because it's not fair for me to have an idea, not act on it. Then someone else actually has the idea and acts on it. It's not fair for me to say, hey, I thought of that idea first and now I'm not doing anything with it. But you can't do anything with it either because it was in my head first. Do you understand that? Again, the execution of ideas. I really want you to understand that because it's important as we go about this conversation about how to protect yourself from working with third parties so you know what your rights really are and what your limitations are as relates to intellectual property and third parties. And I want you to think about it this way. If you were thinking about buying a house, but didn't take the steps necessary to actually do so, like, could you really be upset that someone bought the house you were thinking about? 
That's the same thing when it comes to these ideas. Like I'm thinking about this, but I'm not doing anything, but you can't have it either. So again, the execution of ideas is what's protected and what's important here. With this in mind, you want to move forward with extreme caution when working with third parties to help you develop your idea, because this is not only a smart thing to do, but it's actually great business practice. And don't let anyone else tell you otherwise or try to shame you and think, make you think that you're doing too much as you're having them do certain things before you'll work with them. So today what I'm going to do is really talk about three things that you can do or you should consider when you're working with third parties in order to make sure that your idea or intellectual property is protected in these arrangements. The first thing you can do to protect yourself is to flush out your idea yourself. I was in a, I was on some platform and someone says, I'm starting a business and I want to hire a coach like right now. Like I want to hire a coach. Now, I believe there's value in receiving coaching and consulting to help you achieve your business goals. The problem I have with it is there's a large amount of people who seek outside help without doing the inside work themselves. Meaning, they begin to consume content and start investing money before they even have a general clue of what their business is. So I believe that before you bring in a third party to validate your idea or to help you with it, you should have an idea of what it is you really want to do, which is why I'm a huge fan of business plans. They're the perfect way to flesh out your idea and gain a clearer picture of what you actually need. Now, businesses, you know, businesses can contain so many components, so many different moving parts. It's easy to get lost down the rabbit hole of getting help where you're not sure what areas you really need help in. I mean, do you really need funding? Have you analyzed the numbers or are you just assuming you will need outside help to get started? And I've had that same problem myself. Like I know I need help, but where do I really need help at? So then I hire people, right? I hire someone to help me, but because I wasn't really clear on my, for myself where I needed help at, because I didn't do the inside work, I end up spending money with someone that I should not have spent money with because they weren't the people that can help me. Like, so I'm spending money on, on, marketing, but that's not the challenge that I'm having. The challenge I'm having is not marketing. The challenge that I'm having is system, but I didn't do the work. If I would have done the work, I would have known that, Hey, the person that I need in my business right now is a systems and processes, um, consultant versus a marketing consultant. So that's why I think it's a really great idea for you to flesh your ideas out yourself. When you spend time fleshing out your ideas before including a third party, it makes protecting your idea a lot easier. You have a written plan that can serve as proof to concept, and now you also have a better understanding of exactly what area you need help in, which means you can specifically look for the help you need rather than exposing your idea to people who can't help you in the first place. Boom, you see what I'm saying? Which brings me to point number two. Limit what you share. No man is an island. Listen, I get that. Everyone's going to need help in some form to build their business and grow their brand. This doesn't mean that the people you work with need to know every aspect of what you're building. They only need to know enough to do their job. Why does your website developer need to know where your products are manufactured? Why does your marketing coach need to know your inner workings of your invention? The more you share unnecessary information, the greater the risk of your idea being used before you've had an opportunity to execute. Limiting the information you share also applies when you're looking to hire. I know a lot of people looking to hire vendors and outside people to help them build apps and other things. When you're going to hire these vendors, you want to make sure that you only provide a general overview of the help you need. During the interview process, you want to ask to see their portfolio and inquire into the work they've done with other clients so you can get a better idea of whether or not they can assist you. Once you narrow it down, so when you first start, you have this huge pool of people. So I'm thinking people that use sites like Upwork or they post a job posting. You know, you're posting it out there for everyone to see. You don't want to put all the information out there. You want to just have an overview of the help that you need. And then once you narrow it down, you can get specific information if it's necessary to close the deal, but only with a written agreement. 
For example, let's say you have an idea to create a website that allows interior decorators to share the portfolios, bid on projects submitted by third parties, while allowing those third party users to create accounts and shop pieces that are showcased on the platform. Now, maybe it's something that's not currently available, which I know that this service is available because I just saw a YouTube video with, um, what is her name? From the one from Frozen and the Good Place. I really like her. I think Christian, can't recall her last name. Anyway, I just saw a YouTube video with her on house where she did a makeover renovation for her sister's basement and they use this platform called house where they can do all that but let's pretend house is coming to the developer and they want to build it because no one has ever done anything like that before right so instead of giving all the detailed information that i just said they would say something like they're looking for a web developer to create a website e-commerce site that allows users to create an account share pictures and submit bids based on other criteria it's general information that allows you to get the help you need without putting the whole idea out there into the world to see. So they didn't give all of the information. They just gave an overview. And then once they find someone that they really want to work with and they're in, under contract, they can go into more details with them. And now speaking of under contract, that brings me to point number three. When you begin working with third parties, it's important to read the contract. If the thought of reading contracts gives you the hives, you know what you should do? Hire an attorney to read it for you. You must know how your ideas in developing intellectual property will be protected. Does the agreement include an assignment of intellectual property? Does it state that the developed intellectual property will be shared between the parties? Is there confidentially confidentiality clause? Does that clause require confidentiality for both parties? Or are you the only person that has to remain silent? These are just a few of the clauses you should look for when a con contract is presented to you. Now, I know in a lot of cases, there are no con like there's not a contract being presented to you. So in those cases, you need to be prepared to have your own contract. And that's whether or not if you, if you don't have a contract that's presented to you, or if the contract that's presented to you doesn't speak to intellectual property, you need to be able to have a written agreement that speaks to these things and you need to do it before the exchange of any ideas you need to be clear on what's protected and what's not and what the expectation is from the other party so written contracts give both parties an opportunity to discuss their intentions and this is true even if you are the person being presented with the contract remember you don't just have to sign that contract as is just because someone gives you a contract doesn't mean you have to just agree to everything in there and just sign it no you read over it make sure it's to your benefit if there's language that is not to your benefit or is not what you thought you agreed to Request a change. So never sign a written agreement that you know is contrary to the oral agreement simply because the other party tells you it'll be different in some other way. You know, oh, I thought we agreed to waive this fee, but the fee is in the contract. Oh, yeah, it'll be waived. It'll be waived. But then something happens and you have this contract that says, oh, you owe this fee and there's no language in there saying that the fee is waived and now they want to enforce it. So you, and, and the reason that's important is because when you have a written contract, the courts aren't going to look outside of the agreement to see what the agreement means. They're going to say, oh, this says you owe a fee. All right. Why didn't you pay the fee? What's in the contract stands, have them change it or don't sign it. It's okay to walk away from something that doesn't serve you. I'll say it again. It is okay to walk away from something that doesn't serve you. In the end, at the end of the day, you're going to be better off for it. And I know I said three points, but I have something else to say about these contracts. And my, and my final point is when you're working with third parties, you have to vet them. Like you have to vet them, not only for their ability to do the job, but their trustworthiness, their values and their morals. These contracts that you're entering into are only as good as the person on the other side. If they have, if they come into the agreement with no intention of honoring it, the damage can be done well before you have the opportunity to enforce the contract. 
The contract you enter into is only as good as the person on the other side. If they come into the agreement with no intention of honoring it, the damage can be done well before you have the opportunity to enforce the contract. If you know this person has a reputation of doing shady work, I don't care what that agreement says. Don't do work with this person because yes, you can enforce it, but now you have to spend more money to enforce it versus just avoiding the relationship in the first place because you know that the likelihood of you getting screwed over is pretty high because they've done it in the past. So don't let that contract give you a false sense of security when you know better. Let me ask you this. How comfortable are you when you when it comes to working with third parties? Let's keep this conversation going. Head over to the website and let me know what your reservations are when it's working when working with third parties. How do you work with third parties? If you need a business plan or if you need to make sure your contract protects your interests, head over to the website, lakaniamurray.com. Make sure to rate the podcast before you leave. And until next time, keep building your business, growing your brand, and owning your genius.